You probably noticed the big pile of uh, mulch out here on the side of the building. Uh, we already have someone that's going to bring their tractor, their loader, and they're going to bring that over. We're going to remulch all of our flower beds out front. Get all of that done. There's some. We may have to replace some uh, uh, hose that's out there. They, what are they called? Drip hose or whatever to turn on. We have been doing quite a bit of watering. Um, so we're going to do some of that. We're going to change some lights, hopefully. And here and in the uh, fellowship hall, we're going to get some light bulbs changed out. Just little odd and end jobs like that to get done. Shouldn't take us very long. Uh, a couple of you might bring a rake or a shovel with you just for the landscaping stuff. But I don't think we're going to need a whole lot of tools. So that's going to happen next Saturday morning, eating at 7. Uh, this Wednesday night, we are going to be watching the very last episode of season 1 of The Chosen. We've been in that. Now this will be, I think there was eight, seven or eight all together. Uh, this Wednesday night will be the last episode of season one. Talk a little bit with the crew Wednesday night. It sounds like we will probably roll into season two. Uh, the men are going to be meeting Wednesday night in their Bible study as well. Questions for that are outside on the table. So if you didn't get questions yet, they're in Matthew chapter 19. So those fellows that are meeting for the men's Bible study, we're also having men and women both in here for the chosen. So you have two choices there. Uh, Wednesday night. What we're going to do is we're going to finish up The Chosen since it's the end of the season, one more episode. We're going to finish that up this Wednesday night and then the following Wednesday night which will actually be the second Wednesday night of the month um, we're going to do our fellowship meal. And we'll get with you on that next week on what to expect for all of that. So come out and be a part of our Wednesday night service, The Chosen, Men's Bible Study. The youth will be joining us as well. And then work day, breakfast on Saturday and then back together for worship on Sunday. So we've got a good week ahead of us. I think that is all the announcements I have. Stay with me if you would. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together, <clears throat> to open our hearts up to the King, to praise you and to worship you in song. I pray right now your anointing and your blessing upon our worship team. Lead them, Lord, by your spirit. Lead them as they lead us this morning in praise and worship. We love you, we praise you, and we ask all this again in Jesus' name. Let's worship together. Praise
This morning, we come to part four of a series that I've titled, Dying, Death, and Life After This Life. If you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, you've missed the first part of that study, which dealt with how we can minister well to the dying. Most of us are going to find ourselves at a place from time to time where we're going to have a friend or a family member, maybe a mom, a dad, an uncle, an aunt, grandma, or grandpa. We might find ourselves standing at the bedside of a loved one who is passing away, and maybe they have just a few moments, a few days, a few hours, whatever, and they're going to pass very soon. So we need to be prepared for that. It's a big part of our lives, and we need to be ready for it. And I pray over these past few weeks You've been better equipped to minister to those who are approaching death by being a minister of comfort, a minister of encouragement, a minister of glorious promises of God, and ministers of the gospel. That's where we've been the last few weeks. Today we move on to the second theme in this series. Today we're going to talk about death. And specifically, I want to answer the question, what does the Bible tell us about death? A year or so ago, Jeff Harvey recommended a book by Randy Alcorn, and I went out and got it. It's a great book. We're going to be talking more about this book uh, when we get into life after life. But Randy Alcorn wrote a book about heaven. But in there, as he's talking about heaven, he says something about death that I thought was very applicable for today. He says, and I quote, Unless Christ returns soon, we're all going to die. We don't like to think about death very much, yet, worldwide, three people die every second. That's 180 people every minute. 11,000 people will die around the world this morning in the time that we're meeting here for service. 11,000 people. Put that in perspective. That's a bunch. If that's true, if death is that common, and we know it is, I mean, I haven't really checked those numbers, but I'm guessing that's probably pretty accurate. Folks, I think the church needs to be prepared to deal with this issue from a biblical worldview. We need to be prepared to offer some answers about death. And that is where I want to go this morning. There's two goals I have to accomplish this morning. One, I want to provide you with a clear biblical understanding of, of death. What does the Bible say about death? And secondly, I want to help, I pray, help cultivate a biblical Christian attitude towards death. So in other words, the better we understand it, the better attitude we're going to have to deal with it. <clears throat> in order to have a clear biblical understanding of death, we have to begin at death's beginning. Where did death come from? Well, Almost everything we want to, if we want to find the beginning of something, we almost always have to turn to the book of beginnings. It's called the book of Genesis. That's what Genesis means, beginnings. So we go to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 7 this morning. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now, I want you to see this right out of the gate. God created us as living beings with two parts. A body that was formed from the earth and a spirit that was breathed to us directly by God. In other words, our spirit is not of this world. Our spirit is not from the ground. It's not from the dirt. Nothing in this world. Our spirit or our soul, and by the way, let me just say, I am one of those who believe that the spirit and the soul are synonymous. There are those who will tell you that your body, soul, and spirit, just ask them to nail down the difference between their soul and spirit, and it gets kind of fuzzy. I think the soul and the spirit are synonymous terms. It's that part of you that's going to live forever. This body is not. You're going to see that this morning. But your soul and your spirit will. So I will use those terms interchangeably. Now, shortly after creation, death began. You go down to verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2. And it says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
Now, we all know how this process ended. Adam and Eve did, in fact, disobey God. They chose to eat from the forbidden tree. But a lot of critics of the Bible will come along right away and say, Aha! There's your first inconsistency. God told Adam and Eve that the moment they ate the fruit, they died. They didn't. They ate the fruit and they went on to live by, I don't know, Adam was 120 years old or something like that. We can come back and say, that's not in fact true. Because when the Bible speaks of death, it speaks of death in two different ways. And I know some of you can't see this board very well, and probably nobody listening online can. You need to understand that death in the scripture is described physically and spiritually. And I can tell you, Adam and Eve experienced spiritual death the moment they chose to eat of that tree. We know that because God showed up right after they ate from the tree. They were already hiding in shame, by the way. God shows up, he finds them, and he ended up pronouncing judgment. First on Adam, <coughs> then on Eve, then he pronounced judgment on the serpent. And you remember what he did with all three of them after that? He booted them out of the garden. They were expelled. They were separated from God at that point. Prior to that, they had close communion with God. Prior to that, Adam and Eve enjoyed a relationship with God that none of us have ever experienced yet. They did. But the moment they sinned, they were booted out of the garden under judgment. Physical death was also initiated at that point. Now, some disagree about this, but there's no mention of God creating death as part of the original design. It sounds as though death came into the equation after the sin of Adam and Eve. Kind of like a flower. If you were to go out and cut a flower off of the stem, that flower looks pretty for a while, right? You can even drop it down in some water and preserve it. But the truth is, the moment that flower is separated from the stem, what begins to happen? Death. In a few days, it's going to look very, very different because it's dying. It's been separated from its life source. Adam and Eve went on to physically die. Now, in both of these, spiritual death and physical death, there's a commonality. And I want you to see it this morning. It's very important. I'm going to write it up here for you. And this is not a very good marker. And it's the word. Oh, that's a terrible marker. <laughs> it's the word separation. I want you to see this this morning. Separation. Physical death, and I'm going to switch markers. Physical death involves a separation of soul from the body. Spiritual death involves a separation of the soul from God. Both physical death and spiritual death involve separation. I want to remind you this morning of the parable, you might remember a few weeks ago, we were in the parable, spent several weeks in the parable of what some call the prodigal son. We call it the parable of the father with two lost sons. And you might remember that the prodigal son, the younger one, goes off, he's partying it up, he's spending all his money on whatever. And the father, when he comes home, the father is he's celebrating, he's telling his servants, oh, my son's home, put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, put a nice robe on his back. Why? Why do we do this? Verse 15, uh, verse 24 of chapter 15. <clears throat> For this my son was dead, but now he's alive again. He was lost, and now he's found, and they begin to celebrate. Why did the father consider his son dead? He wasn't dead. He was out partying it up, living with prostitutes. He was dead because he was separated from the father. The relationship between the father and the son had been severed. So therefore, the son was dead until he came back and was restored to the father. Folks, all of this, physical death and spiritual death, is the direct result of Adam and Eve's, what we call, original sin. This is what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 5. He says, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. I'm going to argue that both physical death and spiritual death entered the world through Adam and Eve's original sin. And you may read that and you think, man, that just totally stinks. Adam and Eve totally screwed it up for all of us. It just doesn't seem fair that sin and death, both spiritually and physically, that has been inherited by all of us because of Adam and Eve's sin. 
Well, don't ever stop at verse 12, because if you go on to verse 19, we see the reversal of that. Romans 5, 19 says, As by the one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience many will be made righteous. God knew it was unfair. He knew it wasn't just. So what does he do? God himself balanced out the scales. God sent another man, his own son, to make it all right. We don't have to make it right. We didn't originally make it wrong. And we don't have to make it right. Except by grace through faith in the, in the gospel. So that brings us from death's beginning to death's ending. And folks, I want you to know this morning, the only hope we have for these physical bodies is a new body. In other words, this physical body has to be renewed. It has to be changed. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 3. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, from heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You're not going to live eternally with that body that you have now. Matter of fact, that body was created originally from dust. Guess what it's going to turn into? It's going to turn into dust again. It's what that old, I believe it's the Ecclesiastes, dust to dust, right? So we come from the dust, so we'll return to the dust. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42, So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. In other words, what's, what we're burying at, on funeral days is an old perishable body. It's a body that's going to decay. It's going to dry up. It's going to turn to dust. But what's raised on the resurrection day is an imperishable body. Imperishable body. As a matter of fact, in that passage in Philippians, it says this body is going to look a whole lot like Christ's glorified body. So if you've ever wondered what kind of physical body you're going to have for all of eternity, go back and consider what Jesus looked like after his resurrection. He looked a lot like himself, but you know what? He was able to kind of walk through doors and appear in places he hadn't been before. He could just kind of poof away and poof over here, right? It was a very different body, but it had some resemblance. We're going to receive a glorified body, and that glorified body is going to have no cancer, no sickness, no disease, no weakness of any kind. Not a single blemish. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says, Behold, I tell you, it's a mystery, but now we know. We may not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In other words, if we are the generation who are alive when Jesus comes back, maybe we don't die, we don't get buried in the ground. Our bodies are still going to be changed before we go to heaven. Because flesh and blood, these old fleshly bodies cannot go into heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So for those who have been saved by grace through faith, we are going to get new, imperishable bodies. Now the question you might ask is, why? Why doesn't God just let us live for all of eternity <coughs> in heaven as a spirit? Why can't we just kind of float around with the angels? Well, I can't answer that exactly, but I can tell you this. Because we weren't created that way. When we were created, we were created as two part creatures. Spirit and body. That's God's original design. That's the way he made us, and that's the way we are going to be for all of eternity. So the only hope for these bodies is that they are transformed, that they're made new. Now let me tell you, the only hope for our spiritual body, our spirits, they have to be made new as well. Jesus used a term to describe this. He called it being born again. Your body can't be born again. Your spirit can be. Some of you probably remember we watched The Chosen the other night. This episode came up. A Pharisee named Nicodemus comes to Jesus late in the night. He has some questions for him. <clears throat> One of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture, in my opinion, is when Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? In other words, he's saying, how can I physically be reborn? And Jesus says, 
You're not physically reborn. He goes on to say, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, in other words, unless you're first born of a woman, natural birth, and then reborn again spiritually, you cannot see the kingdom. We've all been born of water. We've all been born of a natural birth. But unless your spirit is reborn, you cannot see the kingdom. For those of us who believe the gospel, for those of us who have received salvation, we will one day receive a glorified, resurrected body, very similar to our Lord's resurrected body, and that body will be rejoined to our new spirits. I'm here this morning as a living example of a new spirit. I don't have the same spirit in me that I had when I was born. I know for a fact I've been born again, and when that happens, I was given a new spirit. His spirit came, lived inside of me, and transformed my old spirit. I have a new spirit. I'm still in the old body, but I have a new spirit. One of these days, that's going to change. This is how we're going to spend all of eternity. Now, you need to understand, for right now, there's a temporary separation. If I die tomorrow, I would hope maybe you have a funeral. I hope you're all there. You should be. When they put me in the ground, know this. My old body is going to start decaying. It's going to start wasting away. And if the Lord should wait another 100,000 years, whatever, that body's going to turn to dust. Temporarily, my spirit is going to be with Christ for that whole time. That's what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, we would rather be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. So when you die, there's going to be a separation. Your body is going to go in the ground or wherever it goes. And I am of the belief it doesn't really matter. Your body can be blown up, burned up, sent up, whatever. It doesn't matter because that body is going to go away anyway. It does matter where your spirit goes. My spirit is going to be with the Lord. The moment I die, my spirit is going to be with Jesus. My spirit is going to be bodiless until the day of the resurrection. When Jesus returns and there is a resurrection of all the dead, our new spiritual bodies will be formed and will now hold or house our spirits that have been with the Lord. So there will be a reuniting of our spirits with Jesus and our new resurrected bodies. You are going to spend eternity with a body and a spirit because that's the way you were created to be from the beginning. Now for those who do not believe the gospel, they too are going to be separated from their bodies. Unbelievers die, their spirit leaves their body as well. But I remind you, their spirits are still dead spirits. We're all born with dead spirits. Remember, you, you cannot see the kingdom unless your spirit has been reborn. Unless man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. So an unbeliever who leaves this life dies with a dead spirit in them. That dead spirit will be separated from their dead body, but it will not go to be with Christ. I want to remind you of another parable that we studied just <coughs> excuse me, a few weeks ago. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You probably remember those of you who were with us. Jesus said both men died. Where did Lazarus go? He went to Abraham's side. We will, for now, we'll call that heaven. We're going to get more to that later. Rich man didn't go to heaven. He didn't go to Abraham's side. Where did he go? Jesus made it very clear. That spirit went to a place of torment. A place of fiery torment, to be exact. A place that none of us want to go. And folks, the truth of the gospel is this. We don't have to. Nobody has to go there. Christ has made a way for all men to receive eternal life instead of eternal death. And by the way, this eternal death is referred to in the book of Revelation as the second death. <clears throat> Revelation 20 verse 14 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. For those who do not know Christ, they are going to die the first time physically. And then when they are cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity, they will experience the second death. You and I here this morning, I pray that every person here is a born-again believer. If you've been born again, you will never taste the second death. You're going to die once. And then you're going home. 
I hope you have a little bit of clear understanding of what death is all about. It involves separation. A physical soul from the body, a spiritual soul from God. I want to quickly move now to giving you maybe a better um, attitude towards death. And I think we can accomplish this with two passages this morning I want us to look at. The first one, I know you've heard me mention it several times. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. The Apostle Paul's writing the church of Corinth and he says, We are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we, or so we, walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. What he's saying there is while our bodies, our, our earthly, fleshly bodies, while these bodies are joined together with our spirits, although we already have a new, renewed spirit, we are of good courage. Why are we of good courage? Because we walk by faith. We can hold on to the promises of God. We have hope and an eternal glory. But did you know there's coming a day where you will not need faith? There's coming a day where you will not need hope. I honestly think that's what Paul meant when he said, there is faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is which one? Love. You know why love is the greatest? It's the only one that's following you in eternity. When we go to heaven, we don't need hope anymore. We will have the fulfillment of what we hoped for. When we go to heaven, we won't need faith. We will have sight. We will, there's nothing we're going to have to put our faith in because it's going to be boom right there in front of us. Love's going to follow you for all eternity. <clears throat> One day our transformed spirits are going to leave these earthly bodies. And I want you to catch this. Paul says that when we are away from the body, where are we at? We're at home. We're not just with the Lord. We're at home with the Lord. Folks, we were not created to be separated from our Creator. We were not created to be expelled from the garden. Sin did that. We were originally designed and created to be with Him. And one day, believers are going to return to Eden. We're going to be in heaven, the dwelling place of God. That's why I love that passage in John where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. Why does he tell us that? Because we were created for that. We were created to be with him, not separated from him. And I don't want you to miss this. Paul actually says in that passage, he said, we would rather we would rather be away from the body than be home with the Lord. In other words, if you gave Paul a choice, Paul, you want to hang out here a little longer? Or do you want to go home? Paul would be like, get me home. That's where I want to be. Folks, I don't think that's an attitude that's expected of just Paul. I really do believe this must be our attitude as well. We must pray and ask God to help us cultivate a hunger for home. The second passage is very similar to it. The Apostle Paul is writing the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Get this, Paul says, to live, for me to live is Christ. Oh, but to die is even better. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better. You know, if a genie in a bottle were to show up and say, I'm going to give you one wish. What do you desire? What do you wish? I guarantee many of us would say, oh, I want a long life. I want to be here as long as I can. I want to enjoy my kids and my grandkids and my this and my that and this and this and this. That's what I want. I want to just be healthy and live a long time. We know there is no genie in a bottle. But if there was a genie in a bottle and they showed up in Paul's day and said, Hey, Paul, I'm going to give you one wish. Well, would it take me home? That's what he's saying. I know. Get me out of here. Get me home. I know that's where I belong. Why, what would 
drive Paul to say, I would much rather leave this body behind and get to heaven than to hang out another day here. What would make him say that? Because Paul understood, like most of us don't, the glorious heaven that was waiting for him. He knew that no matter how good we might have it here, it's not going to begin to compare to how awesome it's going to be over there. Folks, this hunger for eternal life with Christ it's lacking in a lot of us, myself included at times. And I think it's lacking in the church today largely due to a hunger for earthly things. We have it too good. People in third world countries, the underground church of China and Korea, these people are praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Take me out of here. We desire to be a depart. We want to get out of this persecution and this pain and this suffering. Come quickly, Lord. For those of us with our fishing boats and our golf clubs and our long vacations and our campers and our toys and our kids' ball, volleyball and our kids' basketball and our kids' this and our kids' that and our glorious grandkids, we, we fill our stomachs on earthly stuff. We've grown accustomed to filling our spiritual stomachs on earthly things, even good things. But because of that, we've lost our taste for the glorious goodness of home. When I typed that statement in my notes yesterday, I was reminded of a quote. I had to reach over and grab my old Bible. I went to the cover, flipped through the pages of it, and I found a quote by C.S. Lewis. He wrote in a book called The Weight of Glory. I've read it before, but I want to read it again this morning. C.S. Lewis wrote, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Many of us are like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Folks, we are far too easily filled with the things of this life. And because we're so full of the things of this life, we often pray, oh God, let me sit here a little longer. Give me longer life. I have so much good stuff I want to experience. And God's saying, are you kidding me? If you only knew the good stuff I have waiting for you. I'm not preaching that the church should be people of a death wish. Please don't hear that. Folks, we should not be people who fear death. We should not be people who dread it. As, as uh, R.C. Sproul said, I fear dying, I don't fear death. It's, it, there's a difference. There's one thing to say, man, I am not looking forward to any pain or suffering or, or the hardship on my family. Oh, I, I, I do worry about those things. Hey, that's totally normal. But death? Death's going home. It's our homecoming. And that's one of the reasons that we're spending several weeks talking about dying death and life after this life. My prayer is that we're going to be able to, to draw our attention, mine included, away from this life, even the good things of this life, to the glorious promises of the life that's waiting for us. My prayer is that we will walk each day thankful for what God has given us in this life and enjoying all the wonderful things God's given us. God's been so good to me. I have it much better than I deserve. I believe. I know that. And I'm going to enjoy every wonderful gift and every wonderful day. I'm going to try to make the most of it. I'm going to enjoy it. But I also want to be in a place where when death comes knocking, I can open up the door and I can say with the Apostle Paul, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If I can just paraphrase that for you, when death comes knocking on the door, I'm going to be able to open it up and say, what do you got? Bring it. Because all you can do to me is send me home where I belong. That's as good as you can do. We need to grasp hold of this. We need to share these truths with our friends and our loved ones facing death. Gracious God,
Lord, we need your help this morning. I know that. I know it. We need you to help us find the balance between enjoying every good gift that you bestow on us in this life. We need to be able to balance that, Lord, with becoming too enamored with the things of this life. Lord, prepare us for eternity. Give us a hunger and a desire to see you face to face. Bring us to the place where Paul and the apostles found themselves desiring to depart so that they could be with you. Father, as we walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, we fear no evil because you're with us. And at the end of this life, we all know we will be with you. Give us strength, give us hope and comfort in these truths today. And lastly, Lord, I want to pray again this morning for those who are living with dead spirits. Those who will one day experience the second death unless they repent. I pray that anyone hearing this message will be born again by your great grace through faith in your Son and our Savior Jesus. As our heads are bowed this morning, I'm going to ask if you're here with us this morning and you think, I, I just described you. You're pretty confident. You're not a born-again believer. You know in your heart that if you died today, if death came knocking on your door today, you are not confident that you would end up in heaven. I want to pray for you before you go. I'm not going to ask you to come join me up front, but I want to know who you are. If that's you this morning, you say, Steve, I know in my heart of hearts I am not born again. I need Christ. I want you to quickly slip your hand up so I can see who you are and I can see who I'm praying with. Is there anybody this morning? Hand up and right back down. Praise be to Jesus. Stand with me if you would. Father, I pray your church this morning has not, I pray they have not heard a heavy message. I, I pray they've heard an encouraging word. I pray that we are better equipped to face a very common reality, dying and death. Lord, for us as believers, we, we live this life in hope and expectancy and hunger for the next. And Lord, I confess my own lack of hunger at times. I confess, Lord, my own apathy towards the eternal, because I've become so complacent and so satisfied on the mud pies in the slum. Lord, I, I miss the, the glories of heaven. Father, change our hearts. Set our eyes on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Make us eager for this. And until that day comes, may we live every day in, 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 in thankfulness. Thank you, God, for your goodness and the blessings you bestow on us. But may we also understand that death itself is a blessing for your church. May we approach it eagerly <coughs> with hopeful anticipation. Father, I love these people. I thank you for each and every one of them. I ask, Lord, that they would take this word. They would hide it in their hearts. They would go serve you and walk with you this week. That every, everything they do would be glorifying and honoring you. And when we fail... We know that we have an advocate with the Father. We can repent, we can confess that, and we can keep on keeping on for the kingdom. May we run our race well for your glory. We ask all of this this morning in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you folks. Have a wonderful week.